right, amen. So we're going through Matthew on Thursday nights. We're in Matthew chapter 13. And again, this is another one of those longer chapters, 54 verses. So we'll get through as much as we can uh, tonight. But uh, in Matthew 13, really, um, it's, as it says there in Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered uh, together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables. And that's really what Matthew 13 is, is Jesus speaking many things in parables. In fact, this whole chapter is nothing but parables. Um, if you were to count them there, you'd count seven different parables that Jesus gives in this chapter alone. Of course, he speaks parables in other places in Scripture. Um, a lot of these are repeated elsewhere in parallel passages. But uh, we have, you know, the parable of the sower, the tares and the wheat, the mustard seed, the leaven, the treasure in a field, the pearl of great price, the net cast into the sea. So there's just a lot of different parables here that he gives. And when he goes through these, he really only gives the interpretation for two of the parables. You know, he gives the interpretation of the, sow, uh, the sower that went into his field to sow, and he gives the interpretation of the tares and the wheat. The other ones he kind of just puts out there. And uh, <clears throat> but one thing that they all kind of share in common is that they're likened unto the kingdom of heaven. If you notice there, as Brother Matthew was reading, you would have heard him say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. And again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. Again, the kingdom. he says that over and over. So there's a main theme throughout these um, throughout these parables, and he's relating them all unto the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's trying to teach. Now, so we really, we could look at this chapter, and we could just summarize this chapter. If you were going to say, what's Matthew chapter 13 about? You'd say, well, it's the parables of the kingdom. You know, it's the seven parables of the kingdom. That would be a nice way to just kind of, you know, summarize what Matthew chapter 13 is about. But look here in verse 3 where it goes on and says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up, and some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Verse 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is, it, it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath, that he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, <clears throat> excuse me, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak unto them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. <clears throat> verse, verse 15, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. <clears throat> and he goes on here, and he says towards the end, he said, uh, uh, he, he, that he is in their eyes they have closed at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. So he, he's making it very clear here that the reason he's speaking to these people in parables is because that they are not going to receive the truth. They are not going to believe. He explains here, he says that the, the reason why Jesus, when they ask him, why is it you speak on the parables, he explains and says it's so the Jews could not understand. And that's basically what he just said. The reason I speak to you these guys in parables is so that they won't understand. So that they won't understand. So that their eyes will remain blinded. So they will not believe. So <clears throat> we see here from this example and elsewhere in Scripture that some people are not allowed to understand the Word of God. You know, not everyone can just pick up the Bible and read it and understand it. The Bible is real clear about that. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, and it's not, uh, you know, one group of people that can't just pick up the Bible and read it is the unsaved. I remember a year or so before I got saved and I was interested in the things of, you know, spiritual things, I guess you would call it. You know, I was wondering about the afterlife and that kind of seeking for truth. I remember, uh, you know, at one point picking up the Bible, saying, you know, I've never read the Bible, I've never given the Bible a chance, I've read about a lot of other religions. I'll see what the Bible's about. And my middle name is John, so I thought, well, I'll go to book John. Now, the book of John is a fairly easy book to understand. Man, I got to chapter 3, and I'm like, what is this even about? Some guy, 
eating bugs in the desert and, <laughs> and dunking people in water. I had no idea what it was about. And I remember I put it down and that's all I read. I, I couldn't even understand it. I wasn't intrigued. I didn't have any desire to even understand what it said. But I was unsaved. The Bible makes it real clear that unsaved people cannot just pick up the Bible and understand what it says. It says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. Here in 1 Corinthians, I'm reading from 2, sorry. 1 Corinthians 2, stay there. It says, The minds of them which have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Bible says there that there's people in this world that have their minds blinded by Satan. He's actually made, it un made them unable to understand spiritual things. Now you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 13, which says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. He says it right there. The natural man, the unsaved man, the carnal man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. And that's exactly what my story was just about that I just shared with you about me picking up the book of John. It was foolishness to me. Yeah. I thought this was silly. What is this book even about? And I set it aside. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you cannot understand the Word of God. The unsaved cannot just pick it up. I'm sure there's things they can understand, and of course they can comprehend you know, the grammar and the language and all of that, and there's maybe some surface things, but they can't understand what the message of the Bible is. I mean, think about people who sit under, even go into churches where the Bible's even read. And they still don't understand the gospel because they don't have the Spirit of God. They still don't understand that salvation is by grace through faith. I mean, we go out so many, we knock on doors, and we'll even start to begin to quote verses to people. And they'll finish it for us. We'll say, John 3, 16, for God, and they'll finish the verse. They know it by heart, but they're unsaved. They don't even understand what it means. So the Bible's real clear here that we have to have the Spirit of God in order to understand the Bible. Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. You know, for sake of time, I'm actually just going to have you go to Ephesians 1. That's a whole passage there. But the Bible's real clear that God prevents, just go to Ephesians 1, God prevents some people from understanding His Word. There's some people that won't even be able to understand His Word. <clears throat> you know, it takes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to give a deeper understanding of the Scripture. Even as saved people, if we want to have a deeper understanding of what God's Word is about and understand the intricacies of God's Word, how it all fits together... You know, we have to have a walk with God. We have to be able to, you know, God, there are certain things that God will reveal to us through His Word, you know, as we are filled with the Spirit. Now, we're always sealed by the Spirit, of course. Once we're saved, we're always saved. We can never lose that. We're sealed on the day of our redemption through through the, uh, the redemption is in Christ. Yep. But the Bible also says that we need to be, uh, you know, to let the Word of God dwell richly in us with all wisdom so that we should be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the reason for that is because when we, we are filled with the Holy Ghost, when we have the Word of God dwelling in us, we can go to the Word of God and understand deeper and more profound things out of the Word of God. I mean, that's why you'll hear a preacher who's been preaching for you know many, 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 many years get up and sometimes say, hey, here's something that God, that I finally understood out of the Scriptures. Yep. Or somebody else will come to him and show him something, and it will be something, even someone who's read the Bible a multitude of times will still continue to learn and see things right. out of the Word of God. You know, if you're in Ephesians 1, I'll, I'll quote to you from Psalms 19 where it says, you know, say, well, I don't know about that. I don't know that, you know, once you're saved, you should be able to just understand everything. Well, then why is it that the psalmist prayed, open thou mine eyes, yep. that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law? Right. And that's a prayer that David prayed. He said, you know, and David was a saved man. And so, of course, there's things he was going to understand of the word of God out of the law. But there was also more that was there that he, what, that he wanted to get, that he wanted God to show him. And that's why he prayed for God to open his eyes that he would be able to behold those things. You see, the saved, the saved people, they can receive a greater understanding of God's word by the Holy Ghost. Right there in Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, so it was after he heard of their faith, after they had gotten saved, and the Lord Jesus and the love of unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, not making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So he's praying this for people that are already saved. He's saying, I want God to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. And then he goes on to pray, and he says, I praise further in verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of the calling or what the riches of, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance to the saints. 
So he's praying that these people would have their eyes even more you know, enlightened, their understanding would be enlightened, and that they would uh, receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation through God. Now you say, well, I don't know, why, why would Jesus, why, why is it that God would hide his word from certain people? But I mean, that's exactly what we saw there. He said, the reason I speak on these people in parables is that they will not hear. Why, why is it that some people are not allowed to understand? Well, Jesus explains that there. If you're there at Matthew chapter 13, look, look at verse 12. He says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, that he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. You see, the Jews, they refused to understand. You know, they're the ones that they rejected Christ. They did not want to understand. They had not, and what they had was taken from them. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, it says, What advantage then hath the Jew? God, Paul's asking a question. He says, What advantage is there to being a Jew? What advantage hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? And he answers it. He says, Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were the oracles of were committed the oracles of God. So Paul's explaining, he says, Look, the Jews had an advantage over everybody else. Because under them were committed the oracles of God. They had the Old Testament. They had the law. They had the prophets. They had all of God's word right there. Jesus said that it was the law and the prophets that testified of them. And he said that, you know, he, he went and, and uh, the road to uh, Damascus, he went through all the, the prophets and spoke of those things concerning himself. So they had the opportunity. They had everything they needed right there at their fingertips. But they rejected it. They refused it. And what they had was taken away from them and was given unto him that already had. The Bible says in Hebrew 4, Hebrews 4, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. They had it preached just the same, but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith. You say, well, I don't know that, that Jesus would ever you know, do that to somebody, that he would just shut somebody out and just say, I'm not going to allow you to understand the Scriptures. Well, Jesus said in John 5, 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come that ye might have life. He's saying, look, you have the Word of God. You know it's testifying of me. And even though you have all that, you're still not going to come to me if you have life. You are not going to believe on me. God already knows who's going to believe and who isn't. He doesn't randomly pick and choose who's going to believe. Right. But He already knows the beginning from the end. He already knows who it is that is and is not going to believe. He said in Luke 16, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses, this is of course the parable, or not the parable, but the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and uh, Lazarus, or uh, the rich man is begging to have Lazarus sent to his, his uh, brethren, that he would not come to this place of torment. If you're familiar with that, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them near him. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went, from, uh, unto the, one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I mean, that's, that, that's just a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. That they, even if one rose from the dead, they would not believe. And that's not a, exactly what happened in Jesus Christ. Look there in verse 17, Matthew 13, uh, verse 17. He said, For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When one... Uh, when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catch away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. So now we're getting into that one of those first parables. In fact, the first parable that he gives here. <clears throat> it says there that this seed, it, it fell along, uh, upon the wayside and it could not get into the earth. You know, it remained on the surface. It wasn't able to get into the soil and germinate and grow. And it says it's because it fell upon the wayside. Well, now, what is the wayside? Well, we have these still today. You know, if you ever get out into any kind of an agricultural area, you know, there is still a wayside. It's that two-track that goes around the, the corn. You know, that there, there would be a way. You wouldn't just go marching through somebody's crops, you know, and create a path right through their, their weed or their barley or their corn or whatever it is they were growing. You would take the wayside. You'd go along the side of the, of the way. And, of course, if there's a lot of people traveling, you know, that's going to pack down that earth if you've ever... You know, been on a path like that. You go on these nature trails and, and hiking. You know, those paths will, even if it's not traversed a great deal after time, you know, that stuff, there will, there, nothing will be able to grow there for quite some time. 
If enough people walk on that path, it'll take a long time for that to ever be overgrown again because that earth is just so hard packed. And that's what he's saying about this first group of people in this parable of the sower. That when the word of God comes to them, their heart is so hardened that it's just, it's like the word of God never gets in. It's never able to penetrate it with their heart because it's just so hardened. It's like that dirt on the wayside. And what happens as a result? Of course, the devil is able to easily to come and snatch that away. Just like a bird, if you were to go on the wayside and, and cast seed on it, the birds could just come down and eat it up because it's right there on the surface. It would never get down. You know, birds aren't going to go digging and looking for the seed. Look there in verse 20. It says, But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by, he is offended. So this is another type of person here. Now this is the type of person that does receive the word. He says that he receives the word anon with joy, with, uh, with joy and anon he receives it. Okay. He receives it. He's happy to receive it. So the, the seed has gotten into the earth. You know, this is the same person. Some, of, some people will teach that you know, the, the first, you know, uh, only the last person is this truly saved person. But you know, the, the truth is, it's only the first guy that's not saved. Because the word is not received. The seed does not get into the heart. That's, that's the person that's not saved. He says here that he receives it. He says that he receives it with joy. This is the same person that this parable is talking about. I mean, what is the seed? The seed is the Word of God. Well, who is the Word of God? That's Jesus. So he receives Jesus, right? And salvation is receiving Jesus as opposed to rejecting Him. We know that. <clears throat> now, if you would... Uh, now you know, just stay there. We won't. I'm trying to get through all this for sake of time. I'm, I had some. I was going to have you turn some places, but we'll just we'll keep moving on here. So we see that the second guy he receives the word of God. He receives it. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 10, "He that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me." So what does it mean to receive him? You know, you're, you're receiving the message. If, you, if we go, if, you, if if we're received by somebody, and it's them receiving Christ, right? If somebody we go knock on their door and we say, "Hey, we're from a church. Uh, you know, we want to." You know, give an opportunity to hear the gospel, and they say they receive that. You know, they they were they're receiving the word of God. They're not rejecting it. You know, we give them the gospel, and they receive it. So he goes on. You know, what this what this person is though. You know, it's not an example of an unsaved person. It's the picture of a shallow Christian who cannot endure. It's a picture of somebody who's going to fall out over time. You know, it says there in the, in, when, in the beginning, it says that he withereth away. You know, that's what Jesus said of this person. That the seed is planted, and because it, it endureth for a little while, because it hath no root in itself, it withereth away when the sun comes up when it is scorched. Which means this, if it was able to wither, I mean, think about what is it that withers on a plant? It's not the seed, it's, it's the leaf. Meaning that this seed was able to germinate and grow and begin to become a plant, and then eventually it withered away. So we see the seed had taken root and had begun to grow, and really it's just a picture of somebody who just kind of fades away out of the ministry. And really, this is a common occurrence in ministry. This is something that, you know, if you, if you stay with the ministry for very long, you know, you will see this happen. People come and people go. And people come and people go. And it's just a constant cycle. In fact, it happened in Jesus' ministry. I was going to have you go to John 6, but if you remember in John 6, he, he was giving them the, he was talking to the Jews, and he was again speaking to them in parables about how they had to eat his body, eat his flesh, and drink his blood. And they couldn't understand. He said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit of life. The flesh profiteth nothing. And he explains what it is. And, and there's people there that said, this is a hard saying. And it says that they know they turn back. Many of the disciples turn back and no longer follow him after that, at that point. And he turns to a 12 and says, will you also go away? Do you remember that story? So this even happened in Jesus' ministry. When he had a hard saying, when there was something difficult, is when people will turn back. And, you know, that's, again, we kind of talked about this just recently. The persecution is bound to come. All they that live in godly in Christ Jesus will, shall suffer persecution. Not everybody's going to be able to endure. And often that's what gets people out of the ministry. So we do see that there is a type of Christian, though saved, allows himself to become offended and, and gets out of ministry. Well, you know, if we're part of a ministry that sees people come and go, we shouldn't let that discourage us. And we shouldn't get down and, and say, well, what happened to so-and-so, and why aren't they here? And maybe if we just, you know, trim back the message a little bit. You know, maybe if we didn't preach so hard, maybe if we had a better music program, got some 
you know, some, you know, got the, the bass up here, the drum kit, and started doing a little more rocking out, made it more appealing to people, trying to appeal, but we're not just trying to draw a crowd. You know, we're trying to draw people that want to serve God and do work. You know, it's, it's, it's a matter of quality than over quantity. And uh, so we shouldn't allow that to discourage us. When we see people get offended, get out of ministry, all it means is that we're doing right, that the Word of God is being preached. You know, the Word of, the, you know, the, the, the offense shall come because of the Word of God. You preach enough of the Word of God, you preach the whole thing, somebody's bound to get upset. He goes on and says here in uh, verse 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns... Is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Now what's interesting about this guy, this is another third type here, is that the problem is not the ground. The first guy that, you know, had the, had, uh, had the, the, the stony ground in it, and wasn't able to get much root in it. But this guy, the ground's not the problem. It's, in fact, it supports life. There's thorns already growing there. So it's fruitful ground, it's a good ground. The heart's good. It's in the right place. But the problem is what else is allowed to grow there? You know, it's somebody who lets, as it says there, the, the, the deceitful niches of, of riches, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, they choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So the thorns there, they're the cares and the riches, the concerns of this life. And really, this is a consistent principle throughout Scripture, is that you can't have both. You know, you can't serve God and mammon. That's right. No man can have two masters. You either love the one or hate the other, or else to cling to one and, and, and deny the other. You have to choose in the Christian life where your loyalty is going to lie. What is it that you're going to concern your, your, yourself with in this life? What are your goals and ambitions going to be in this life? Is it going to be the things of Christ or the things of the world, the things that the world cares about? The houses, the riches, the you know, all the the things that people get caught up in, the vacations the, and the toys and, and retirement plans, all the things, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches. You can't have it both ways. You have to pick one or the other. And this is an example of a guy that can do that. He didn't bother to take the time to get the thorns out. The ground was good. Could have done. He could have borne a lot of fruit. Could have done a lot of great things for God. But he wanted the thorns there too. And what happened is eventually those thorns, it says he becometh unfruitful. Not he was immediately unfruitful. So a lot of people, they can start out good, but if they're not careful and they don't start to deal with the thorns and the briars that are in their life, those things can creep up and begin to choke the word in their heart. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Godliness contentment is great gain. For he brought nothing into this world, and it certainly can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But he that will be rich shall fall, uh, fall into temptation. He that will be rich... Uh, fall into temptation and to a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, there's a lot of strong warnings about riches in the Bible, but if, if we make our life just about making money and seeing how far ahead we can get, I'm not against, I don't think it's wrong for a person to do well for themselves and through hard work and integrity, you know, they just, God blesses them and prospers them in some business. There's nothing wrong with that. But if they make their goal, you know, is building up a bank account and making sure that they have, you know, enough money in case anything ever goes wrong and just making sure that, you know, they have a retirement plan in place and that they're never going to have any financial struggles. If you make that the goal in your life, it will choke out the things of Christ. Yeah. You know, you'll start to say, that soul winning time isn't important. I, I need to get these hours in. You know, I, I'd like to be at church, but man, I've got to be at work. You know, it's more important to me now. You know, that's going to that's gonna choke out the Word of God in your heart. And it's a process that takes place over time. You know, we should never fool ourselves and think that, you know, we can do both. And, and it might seem like we're getting away with it for a little while, but those decisions that we make and what are, you know, based on our priorities, you know, that will catch up with you in time. That thorn in, will eventually grow up in your life and choke out the word. Now going on there, it says there in verse 23, but he that uh, receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth and, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold and some sixty and some thirty. Now, if you would turn over to Galatians chapter five, and this is an important concept to get because there's a, a, some people who have this a real misunderstanding of what a, what a fruitful Christian looks like, or what it means to be a fruitful Christian. You see, the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. Yeah. 
That's what our fruit is. Jesus is saying here that when the when the seed when, we, uh, when the when the seed is planted in a good heart, in the, in the good soil, that it brings forth, you know, much fruit. That it brings forth some thirty, some sixty, and some hundred fold. Now, what is it? What is that fruit that it brings forth? It's another Christian. That's right. The fruit of a Christian and the fruit of the Spirit are their own fruits. Because a lot of people say, well, I am a fruitful Christian because I have the fruits of the Spirit. And they think that that's them bearing fruit. Well, that's not you bearing fruit. That's the Spirit bearing fruit. And we've, I've explained this to people, and they just look at you like, they just, here's the thing, they don't want to get it. Yeah. They know it's right. They don't want to understand it, though. And there's a reason for it. There, there is a fruit of a Christian and there is the fruit of the Spirit and they're separate things. They're not one and the same. Each fruit is specifically described, isn't it? The fruit of the Spirit is described here in Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, I mean, it can't be any more plain than that. It's the Spirit's fruit. It's not your fruit. Not the fruit that you will bear. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And you, you tell people this and they just they don't want to get it. Is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against their such there is no law. You see, the Spirit will bear fruit in our life if we walk in the Spirit. It's going to happen. We don't have to drum that up. We don't have to like make, make that work. You know, if we're in the Word of God, if we're you know keeping our slate clean with God, confessing our sins, trying to do the best we can, living for God, and 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 fellowshipping and, and, and living for the Lord. You know, the Spirit is naturally going to bear fruit in your life. And, if, you know, we could even think of people, you know, in, in church and, and other Christians that we know, they bear these things. I mean, they, they have these fruits in there. They have love. They go out soul winning. They care about the lost. They have that love. They didn't have to wake up that morning going, do I love lost people? Yes, I do. And make sure they didn't have to flip some switch in their, and, 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 think, and they remind themselves to, to love lost people. Yeah. It's just there. It's the fruit of the Spirit bearing a, a fruit in their life. You know, another fruit is the joy. I mean, some of the most joyful, happy people I know are people who love God and are in church. They have peace. They have long-suffering. They have all these fruits. But it's not like they go down a checklist every morning and making sure that they go out and they practice every one of these things. These are things that the Spirit will bear in your own life if you walk in the Spirit. The Bible says in, in that same passage there, Galatians 5, look at verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, if the Spirit has given us life, it's the Spirit has sealed us in the day of redemption. If we're Christ, we might as well live like it. We might as well walk also in the Spirit and let Him bear that fruit in our life. Now turn over to Proverbs chapter 11. That's why it's real important, Proverbs chapter 11. That's why it's real important not also to not quench the Spirit. And the Bible says you can do that. That the Spirit wants to bear these fruits in your life, and then you can actually quench Him. And then you can actually prevent that from happening. By getting backslidden, by getting out of church, by allowing sin into your life. <clears throat> so we see the fruit of the Spirit is real specific. It tells you exactly what those things are. And those are things that are related, you know, the, these things like love, joy, peace, long-suffering. These, these are all personal things. These are all part of your attitude or your personality. These are all, all things that emanate from within you. But... The fruit of the Christian is something with, is, is not internal, it's external. It's another Christian. <clears throat> it looks there in, in Proverbs chapter 11, it says there in verse 30, the fruit of the righteous. Okay, now who are the righteous? The saved, the born again, believers in Christ. Right. Right? They are the righteous. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. So you have to kind of think about this for a second. And it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Mm -hmm. So where does fruit come from? It comes from a tree. Right? So fruit falls, fruit, a tree grows into maturity, it blooms, it has fruit. That fruit has the seed in itself, it falls to the ground, goes into the earth, and bears another tree. That's right. It's not the same tree, it's another tree. So the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. It's another, so if we're likened unto a, a tree as Christians, you know, if we're likening ourselves unto this tree like, like the Bible is here, you know, if we bear fruit in our life, we're going to bear another tree. Well, what would the other tree be? It would be another fruit-bearing Christian. Yep. This Bible, this isn't really complicated. And, it, and you know, in the same sentence he says right there that he that winneth souls is wise. Yep. So it's directly tied in with soul winning. I mean, it's directly related to this concept of the righteous bearing fruit. And if this is not difficult to understand. And you can show this to people 
And they'll still deny it and say, no, I'm fruitful because I have the fruits of the Spirit. And you wonder if you really do, if, if you don't have enough love in your heart to go out and preach the gospel to say, I really wonder if you do have the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, that's right. I wonder if maybe you're just fooling yourself into thinking that and just telling yourself and looking in the mirror and say, I have the fruit of the Spirit. But you won't go out and knock a single door. And Christians will live their whole life and never one time even care to share the gospel with another Christian. You know, and only lazy Christians with a fake sense of spirituality need this explained to them. Yeah. I mean, the Christians that, that understand this to be so, they don't have to, I don't have to get up and pontificate on this and, you know, and go overboard with this explaining. Everyone in here is getting it. But it's the lazy ones who don't, they don't, here's the reason why they don't want to be true, because they're lazy. Because they'd rather just sit back and, and convince themselves that they have the fruit of the Spirit because they're too lazy to actually go out and do the work that is required in order for a Christian to truly bear fruit in their life. I mean, does it not take work to go soul winning? Does it not take work to, to gather together, to print out the maps, to pick out an area, to assemble as teams? How about just learning how to give the gospel? That takes effort. That's why you have to go with somebody who knows, mark out your Bible, get over the, 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 the fear and the nervousness of actually speaking to somebody at the door, yeah. then become effective at it, yeah. you know, and then actually once you do that, then become consistent to where you're going to do it for the you know, uh, for a regular amount of time every week or whatever it is that you're able to do and go out and bear that fruit. It takes effort. Yeah. That's why it's a lot easier to just say, well, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is how loving I am, how much joy, peace, and long-suffering I have. You know, and that's people that they just want to fool themselves into thinking that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. Jesus said in, here, in John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Yeah. You know, the people that they want to go ahead and think that the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of a Christian is not other souls. They want to think that just them being so holy and righteous in their ivory tower and never once going out into the highways and byways and getting their hands dirty talking to lost sinners. They're not glorifying God. They can sit there in their immaculate churches and convince themselves that, they're, that God is pleased with them. The Bible says right here that they're not, that He isn't. He's not glorified by lazy, do-nothing Christians who just want to pat themselves on the back. Amen. <clears throat> now, it's interesting also here when Jesus is giving this parable about the, the, good, the good ground bearing fruit, is He gives those three quantities. He says the 30, the 60, and the 100 fold, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we have to remember that the quantity of that yield is a seasonal thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, some people, maybe some people will only save, get 30 people saved in their life. They'll only, you know, produce, you know, reproduce themselves spiritually 30 times in their whole life. Could be. You know, but I believe that's something that we can attain to on every year. Yeah. And I said some 30, some 60, some 100. Because the thing is, not everybody's going to have the time and energy and resources and ability to go out and win 100 people to Christ. That takes a lot of work. I mean, it takes a lot of dedication. You know, if you have family and you have other obligations, you have a lot of responsibilities, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be a little bit harder to get out there and get 100 people saved. You know, or, you know, and it maybe you have a little bit more time, but you can only get 60. And some of us, I mean, you think about the busy moms and things like that, that have a very tight schedule and have a very narrow window of opportunity to go out and preach the gospel, perhaps. They might only get 30, you know, if they're, if they're consistent, maybe even less. But you know what? In all of those quantities, God is glorified. And every single one of them, he's pleased. Yeah, that's right. And every single one of them, you've done what you can with what you have available to you. That's right. And you know what? You're way ahead of the other guy who just wants to say, well, I'm bearing fruit because I'm so special. And I, I have a warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart yeah. about how long-suffering I am. Yeah. <clears throat> so they're way ahead of those people. But it's interesting there that it's like a fruit tree, and a fruit tree is seasonal. This is something you could do 30 people every year. Yeah. You know, and some people set goals for themselves, and I think that's great. They say, I want to get X amount of people saved every year. Personally, I, I haven't kept track. I was going to do that this year, and I've never, I just always forget to do it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just to figure out how many people I've seen saved. I guess I'll find out in heaven. You know, I'll get there, and God will tell me, and I'll, I'll be, and maybe, maybe I should start doing it, you know. I'm just kind of thinking out the cuff here. Maybe I should, just because of the fact maybe I'd do more. Maybe if I said, man, I only got... You know, X amount of people say that I have plenty, I have more time, I should be getting more people saved than, than so-and-so who has less time to do it. Yeah. You know, and not to put the other guy down, but just to say, you know, to, to, to encourage myself to take advantage of the opportunity that I have. Yeah. So, I guess I, at least somebody's getting some of the sermon tonight, right? <laughs> so, anyway, it says here in verse 24, we'll move on here, it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, 
The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed seed in, a good, in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, there appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder uh, came and said unto them, Unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather them up of the tares, ye root up uh, with the, uh, ye root up, root up also the wheat with them. Let them both go together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye uh, together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now I'm not going to take the time to go through this. Jesus, this is the other one that Jesus explains. He explains this parable, verses 36 for 43. You know, and go ahead and pray and ask God to open your eyes and you may behold wondrous things out of his law and go read those verses and, and you can get the explanation of this. It's really straightforward when he's talking about, he explains it, you know, the 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 the, 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 the field is the is the is the the world, you know, the angel the reapers are the angels, right? And so on and so forth. Real easy to understand what he's, what he's uh, saying here. So for sake of time, let's move along here into verse 31. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it's grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge the branches thereof. Another parable he spake unto them, uh, unto them, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. So what's what's kind of the common trait here? You know, what is it that he's kind of getting across here? Well, we see really right out the, on the surface that something very small becoming very big. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the seed of a you know, mustard seed becoming a great tree. He's talking about a little leaven being sown in a lump and the whole thing becoming leaven. So the kingdom of heaven is something that is going to grow. It is something that is going to spread. It is something that is going to enlarge. I mean, Jesus said in Luke 12, he called them, he said, fear not, little flock. I mean, when he started out with 120, you know, on the day of Pentecost, and it very quickly began to multiply. You know, when the church started, in infancy was a very small thing. But we saw, to the point where Jesus even called them a little flock. He said it was a very small thing. But in Revelation 7, what do we see at the rapture, in the end times? A great multitude which no man could number standing before the throne. So we see that kingdom of heaven is like that. It's something that started out very small and has grown into something very large. Verse 34, it says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parable. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went to the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And again, he goes on through there and explains that parable. Look at verse 44. <clears throat> he says here, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure in a field, a treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth it. And for joy thereof goeth and sell all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man, seeking good, goodly pearls. Who hath, when he found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom is like into a net, which is cast in the sea and gathered, uh, and, and gathered of every kind. And when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good in the vessels, but cast the bad away. So again, there's this common trait here: is the people doing business. You see a lot of these transactions. You see, you know, the fisherman doing his work. You see the guy who, you know, is, is a, a, a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. To see another guy who buys a field, right? There's all these transactions going on. So what we see here is somebody obtaining something very valuable among things that are less valuable. And really that's kind of what the kingdom of heaven is like. Is, is, some, is, is God going and purchasing something that he puts a great value on. Which is what? The souls of men. Mm -hmm. That's what the kingdom of heaven is made up of. Is made up of believers that Jesus Christ went and purchased with His own blood. Amen. So we see that it's it's likened unto it in that sense that it was a man, uh, you know, that went and buyeth that field. There was a particular field that he wanted, and he bought that field. He didn't buy the other field. He didn't buy any of them. Why? Because that field had a great treasure in it, and that's what Jesus did for us. When He He, he looks down at us, and He sees the opportunity to go out and purchase, you know, His bride, go out and purchase and redeem lost sinners to Himself. Amen. 
He does the same thing with the, with the pearl of great price. And the guy had other pearls, but he saw this one pearl that he really wanted, and he sold all the other ones and bought it. <clears throat> and this is really a model of Jesus' ministry. I mean, that's basically what he did. I mean, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why he came, was to seek and to save, to find that pearl of great price, to find that treasure in that one field, and to buy it with his own life. He goes on here in verse 49, it says, So it shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth, and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. They didn't really need any further explanation. These parables were enough for them to understand. These very brief explanations. And that's why I don't really think that we have to dive real deep into these parables. They're pretty, they're pretty simple parables to understand. And yet the Jews could not understand them. And that there were those there who their minds had been blinded, their hearts had been hardened, they couldn't even understand these simple parables. I mean, likens it unto a man casting a net into the sea and gathering it, and when it is full, gathering it in, and keeping that which is good, and casting away that which is bad. I mean, what a more perfect picture than the end of the world, of the angels coming forth and gathering, you know, the, the saved, and getting rid of the unsaved, getting rid of the wicked. It's not that hard to understand, but there were those there that could not understand it. And it came to pass, verse 53, uh, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And he would come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch as they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not mighty many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So Jesus here is kind of showing us and setting an example what many of us will experience. You know, if you've been saved later in life, maybe you didn't grow up in a Christian home, you don't have a saved family or saved parents. You know, this is something you can really relate to. You know, I mean, I know when I first got saved, they were like, who in the world are you? I remember my older sister saying, at one point saying, you know, the you of two, two years ago would make fun of the you of today. You, the, the old you would make fun of the you today. And I was like, you're right. Yeah. But you know what? People change. Amen. Well, that's what she was saying. Whence is this man? Yeah. Who yeah. is this? Who is this guy? Who are you? What changed? Yeah. My mom, she was like, you need to go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> right? They're offended. What do you mean you're a Christian now? Yeah. You know, especially if you come out of a kind of a liberal background, yeah. which I did. I have, my family was very liberal. Is very liberal. You know, you know, now you're a Bible-believing Christian? Yep. Man, talk about being at odds, you know? <laughs> but that's the example of Jesus here. I mean, he went there, and they're like, what's so special about this guy? Why, where, where did he get this wisdom? And it's because they didn't understand him, and he was not able to do many mighty works there. You know, it might be, be our family is going to be our toughest, you know, souls to win are going to be those that know you. Yeah. Especially, like I said, if you got saved in later life, because you know what? They know all, all that they got the dirt on you. Yeah. They know what you used to be like. They know how you used to be. You know, and they, they, they have a hard time reconciling the two. And that's just something that Jesus, you know, said was going to happen. He said in Mark or Matthew 10, we already read this a few weeks ago, Think not that I am come to send peace in the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come uh, to set a man at variance with his father. He said, a man's foes shall be those of his own household. Right. So that was that's something that Jesus said was going to happen. That's what, something we see Jesus going through right here. His foes were those of his own household. You know, your family is going to be the hardest to win. They really are in many instances. They will be the most difficult, especially, I think, more, probably one of the hardest relationships you'll ever go through to try and win somebody is a child trying to win a parent to the Lord. I know I struggled with that for a long time. And I've talked about this in other sermons, of what it took to get my mom saved. I mean, it literally took a deathbed. It was tough to get my mom saved. But she came, and it took many, many, many years. And by the way, it wasn't many, many, many years of me going to her and harping on her every day about how oh, she's going to go to hell and needs to get saved and this and that. And to be perfectly honest, you know, my heart probably didn't grow a little calloused in that time. And probably, you know, a little less uh, concerned about it. Yeah. But, you know, God didn't give up on her. And he worked on her, and you know, and, and, and things fell out onto her, you know, in life that she she was uh, more softened towards the God, the things of God and the gospel. 
But your family is going to be the hardest to, to, to win to the Lord. But my admonishment is to never give up. And if you would, we'll close on this. You go to Galatians chapter 1. Because we saw there, you know, in, in other places in Scripture where it says that the bre that, even, that Jesus' brothers, neither did they believe. They didn't believe He was Christ. They even rejected some, for some time the claims that He was making. Saying, you know, they, neither did they believe. And we see here that these people in His, in his, in his own hometown, they didn't believe on Him. But if you look here in Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 18. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles I saw, saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. So James, the Lord's brother, became an apostle. Now you can't be an apostle without believing in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's kind of one of the criteria. you got to be saved. So we saw that eventually, over time, Jesus' own brothers, they did believe on him. Yeah. You know, they did understand who he was and put their faith in him. You know, and some people, I, I don't know how you would prove it, whether or not the book of James was this James here. There's several other, you know, men named James in the Bible. But it's interesting if it is that James, you know, and I, I tend to believe it is, because he's, he doesn't open up the book of James saying, the brother of the Lord Jesus. He says, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. He calls himself a servant. Now, maybe that wasn't that James. I don't know. I'll give you that caveat. But he's definitely an apostle. He was definitely somebody that came around and believed. So, you know, it's a, you know there's, this chapter has got some real, uh, you know, a lot of parables in them, and, it, and they're pretty simple, but it's got a really important principle in it that shows us that there are some people who cannot receive the things of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. Even the most simple, basic things will go right over the unsaved's head. Yeah. And there can people get to a point where God just completely blinds their minds if they continue to reject, like the Jews did where they had all the opportunity in the world to understand who Christ was. They had the scriptures. They had the oracles of God committed unto them from the very beginning. They should have known all these things. And they rejected all that. And God even made it to the point where they couldn't even understand these simple parables. These are not hard to understand parables. Now there's a lot of great profound truths that we could probably pull out of them and make a lot of different comparisons, especially if we got an end times prophecy about the angels and the tares and the wean. There's a lot of things we can learn. But it didn't take a lot for the disciples to understand, did it? They said, do you understand all these things? Yeah, Lord. Mm -hmm. They understood it very easily. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, it, it, you know, just some great truths in there. And, um, you know, most of all, I mean, the, the thing we can really take away from this is the fact that, you know, we are going to have to be patient with our family. You know, we're going to have to give them time and space and uh, just pray that the Lord works in their heart um, um, uh, more than anything. You know, I preached a sermon... Uh, you know, on that subject called uh, hope for hard cases. You know, and if that's anybody in the room that's dealing with family, I would really admonish you to go listen to that sermon because um, I deal with that a little bit more. You know, maybe maybe the, you're probably not going to learn anything about you know about what to do, but it's maybe more of an encouragement. But you know, I just want to admonish you never to give up on your family because I know how hard that can be to sit there and not and then and then just kind of throwing it all back in your face and saying. Who is this man? Whence did you get this wisdom? You know, you start quoting Bible verses, and they're like, you know, "How do you know that?" But don't give up on them, you know, because um, they, they they will get saved. You know, if if you know, Lord willing, you know, obviously at the end of the day, you can't make anybody get saved. You can't twist their arm. But the best thing to do is just to be a consistent example, to be that light, like Jesus was. You know, he didn't he didn't go off on a tirade here. He didn't do many great works among them. He just went out and did what he had to do in other places, and eventually they came around. They saw his consistent testimony, and that's eventually what won them. Let's go ahead and pray.